Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. My name is David Emmert. I'm one of the pastors here and really excited about today. Great chance for us to get into the Word together. Uh, if you're new here, uh, we're starting a brand new sermon series today. It's uh, taking a look at a book called 1 Peter. In fact, if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead, open it up, find 1 Peter, get that done right now. We'll be in the first chapter, obviously, at the beginning. Uh, throughout uh, the morning. If you don't have a Bible with you in the row in front of you beneath the seat, you'll find a Bible down there. It's on a little metal rack. You can pull that Bible out, use it throughout the day, take it home, give it to a friend. We just want to know that Bible is being used. But really looking forward to this little book of First Peter and what it's got to say to us. So let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to jump right in and get started. Father, we love you. We are delighted to be here today uh, to have the chance to look into your word. It's always a privilege and a treat that we don't need to take for granted. And so, Lord, we just ask that as we open up your word, we are reminded of its truth and of its power and of its transforming capacity and ability through the strength of the Holy Spirit who helps us understand what it has to say. And we also ask, Lord, that as we encounter things today that sort of knock us off of our rocker a little bit and maybe challenge what we think or, uh, or what we believe, Lord, that we will make the decision now that we are going to conform our life to the clear teaching of your word. So we pray this in Jesus' great name, and everyone agreed and said, Amen. All right, now, 1 Peter was written by who? Who? Okay, it's not a trick question. Give it to me one more time. Who wrote it? Peter, very good, very good. You all did better than the first service, probably not quite as well as the second overall. So you, you came in a solid second place there with that one. That's good. But you'll have other chances to redeem yourself throughout the morning, so just stay with it. All right, so Peter wrote the book of First Peter. Now, who was Peter? Well, Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. In fact, he was sort of the ringleader of the 12, and so he's someone who had the opportunity to get to know Jesus about as, as well as anybody on this earth ever got to know Jesus in his earthly ministry. Now, if someone who was a true insider with Jesus were to come to you and say, hey, listen, I would like to invite you to come and let me talk to you uh, all about Jesus and kind of explain things to you, you would pay money for that kind of insight, wouldn't you? I mean, that would be a big deal to get that kind of opportunity. Well, Peter is giving us that opportunity uh, today when we dig into his word. I mean, that's what he's offering us is this insight into the reality of what Jesus was thinking and preaching and teaching. And so we get this incredible look at what was going on with Jesus. Now, also we know that Peter was a fisherman. He was not a man who had a college education or anything like that. But as a fisherman who had other people in his employ, who had to understand what it means to buy and sell and work the marketplace, obviously this is a guy who knows hard work, right? Because fishing for a living, very difficult, very physical, a lot of manual labor. He understands that, but he also understands how to make a small business work. And you all, let me tell you, if you've never tried to run a small business, it's one of the most terrifying things you'll ever do. I mean, you are out there, and it's all about your own wits and your own skill, and there's no safety net for you. And so Peter could pull that off. So he obviously was a sharp guy. But again, no formal education. And so you might be thinking, well, if a person had no formal education, why would we want to read a letter written to him and count it as truth? Well, the reason is because while Peter never went to college, he was educated by Jesus Christ himself. And I would submit to you that, you know, learning for three years from Jesus, which is the opportunity that Peter had, I'd submit to you that's the equivalent of a PhD, okay? So this guy had opportunities to learn that, you know, let's face it, you and I will never quite get to have, right? In fact, some of the people who were around Jesus, around Peter, rather, back during the day, who were his critics, when they encountered Peter's teaching and, and had the chance to talk with him about doctrine, this is what they said in Acts 4.13. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with who? They'd been with Jesus. So Peter knows his stuff because he's been taught by Jesus himself. And so in the letter of 1 Peter, he's going to tackle some really huge, gigantic, and difficult theological themes. He's going to talk about things like foreknowledge, and election, and obedience, and sanctification, and the Trinity, and revelation, and the hope of Christ, and all of this kind of stuff. It's not easy pushover material. He's not just writing a letter saying, hi, y'all. 
you know, hope you're well. That's not at all what he's going to do. He's got some place that he's going to take us. And Peter has got the firepower to help get us there, okay? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to knock us off our feet in this little short letter of 1 Peter. Now, he's writing this letter to a group of people who are hurting. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. And they're hurting because of when this letter was written. Most scholars believe it was between A.D. 60 and A.D. 65. And at that time, in the Roman Empire, the emperor was a man named Nero. Nero was the worst of the worst. It doesn't get any worse than this guy. Listen, never name your children Nero. Don't even name your dog Nero, okay? This was a terrible, terrible, horrible person. Uh, he killed his own mother. That's pretty low, isn't it? He killed his first wife. It's believed that he killed his second wife. Like, who would keep marrying this guy, right? Okay? Uh, who, who would sign up for that? But his biggest knock was that um, history leads us to believe that he set the city of Rome on fire because he fancied himself to be a bit of an architect and he felt like the city needed a bit of remodeling. So he decided he would just burn the place down. Now, it always helps me to bring this into modern context. So imagine if you would, if the leader of Japan or the leader of France or the leader of the United States decided they would burn Tokyo or Paris or Washington, D.C., they would burn it to the ground just so they could start over. Do you see how outrageous this would be? And that's who Nero was. The city burned for nine days. Imagine the human suffering that unfolded as for nine days, a mega city just raged on fire out of control. People were killed, property was lost. I mean, this was a devastating blow. Nero realizes that he's gonna, you know, even for him, he's gone too far, right? I mean, that, that dawns on him. So he needs somebody to blame. So guess who he decides he's gonna blame? He decides he's gonna blame the Christians. Now, the Christians were already a persecuted minority, as it was, and now, They've been declared basically an enemy of the state. So there's official persecution brought upon them by the Roman government. But imagine how your friends, your neighbors, the people that you live around, how they would react if they believed that Christians burned the city to the ground and you claim to be one of them. This was a very difficult time. And so Peter writes this letter and he's going to encourage them, and he's going to explain to them how you live during really difficult times. And some of you all are going through your own difficult time. It may not be the kind of persecution or the hardship that the people were facing that first read Peter's letter, but that doesn't make your difficulty, your hardship, any less real. And I just want you to know, if you're going through a hard time, this letter's for you. Not being encouraging, I guess the other end of it is, if you're not going through a hard time, your turn will come, right? So pay attention and study in advance. Be prepared, right? All right, so let's go ahead and dig in and see what this letter would say to us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, here we go. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, right now, some of you are looking at these first couple of verses. Why couldn't he have just said, hey, y'all, how's it going? Because I'm lost already, and we're only two verses into this thing. Hey, don't be discouraged. We're going to work our way right through this piece of Scripture, no problem at all. So we've already talked about Peter and the fact that he was an apostle, one of the twelve, of Jesus Christ. And then he says he's writing to those who are elect exiles. And then he goes on and gives these place names, Pontus, Galatia, and so the area that he describes here covers 300,000 square miles. So he's saying, hey, to these people, 300,000 square miles worth of people, imagine this letter, multiple copies circulating all over that area. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to write and encourage you all because even though over a 300,000 square mile area, you have different cultures and different backgrounds, what do you share in common? You share in common the fact that you are an exile, a stranger, a foreigner, a sojourner in your own home. Why? Because you are elect by God. Now this term elect gives people, has given people in the church difficulties since time began. 
I'm going to just kind of lay out for you what I believe that elect is all about. I believe that bottom line, elect is all about the fact that God knew before time began that when he created humanity, humanity would sin. And that God knew before time began that he would send his only son, Jesus Christ, to die and pay the penalty of that sin because sin means death. That's what it means. And God knew from the beginning of time that you would be born and he knew that I would be born. And he knew before time began that you would need a Savior and that I would need a Savior. And before time even began, God has chosen to love you and to love me enough that he would say to you, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And God knew from before time began that it wasn't going to be just for people who were born with a certain nationality or born in a certain location or who came from a certain family or all of that. He knew that from the beginning of time that his people would be comprised of the people who chose to believe in his mercy and his grace and accepted his work to redeem and restore and make us new. So Peter writes, and he says, hey, for those of you who are scattered across the Roman Empire, who are suffering terribly because you have the audacity to hope in Jesus Christ, I am talking to you. May grace and peace be multiplied. And he says, listen, I know, I know that you guys are strangers. I know you stick out. I know you don't fit in. And you don't fit in uh, because God has chosen you in this way, and he has sanctified you in the Spirit. He's calling you out to be different, and he's empowering you to le- live differently. You see, as a believer in Jesus Christ, this is what I claim, okay? I claim that I am a sinner and that without the grace of God, I deserve to be condemned for my sin. And I claim that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life. That blows me away because that's so far from me, right? He came and he lived a perfect life. Not only that, but he was born of a virgin by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. And he lived this perfect life. And then he willingly gave his life for mine. He paid the penalty of my sin. And I believe that he took my sin and my shame and my guilt and he bore it on the cross. And in exchange, he has given me his place and his hope and his mercy and his goodness. And I believe that because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, I have an eternal hope in heaven that is kept by God's power. That's what I believe. And our world today and the world back in the day of Peter looks at what I believe and what hopefully you believe and they say, that is strange. That is just weird. And you all, people are in our day, they're looking at us more and more often going, no, that's really weird. Do you realize how weird you are if you believe that? And because you believe that, you're a stranger. Now, keep in mind, these people had never been more than 50 miles, most of them from their own hometown. No airplane, no buses, no cars. You guys get the idea. How are you going to travel long distances? So most of them were right there in their hometown. And he says, hey, listen, you all are aliens and strangers and foreigners, even though you've never left home. You're, You're strangers in your own home. Have you ever been in a culture where you live there, but you know good and well you don't fit in? You all know that for a lot of years I lived in Africa, loved it, loved living there, lived in Ethiopia, lived there for a decade. And there were plenty of times, even though that I spoke the language at that time, I spoke it pretty well, and I could teach in the language, and I had a lot of Ethiopian friends, that I, and I still keep up with them, and I love them. They're great people, and I care about them. They're some of the finest believers in Christ that I've ever met. And even though I got to know what it meant to live in that country, I was constantly reminded that I didn't fit in. I'll never forget the first time that I went to someone's home and they were breaking out a brand new baby. Now, we've all done that before, right? You know, you've gone over to a family member, they've had a new child, a new addition. You're so excited for them. And so everybody gathers to see the new baby and here's the baby and everybody's, you know, can we all say it together? Can we all say, aw, aw, see, isn't that nice? Yeah, and they're passing the baby around. So I'm watching this happen, right? And so they're passing the baby around and they do this weird thing. They start spitting on the baby. I'm like, that's just nasty, man. What are you doing? And every baby get passed around. And I'm like, that is just unseemly, right? 
And the baby comes to me, I'm like, hey, I'm not going to spit on you, nice little baby, right? You know? What? I called it showers of blessing. I don't know what it's really called. But I just thought, that is so gross. You know what I realized when I saw them spitting on a baby? I am a stranger here. I may live here. I may know the language. I may even get some of the customs. But I'm not a baby spitter. I, I'm a stranger from the outside, right? Peter is saying, listen, you may be living in your own home, but you have chosen to believe the hope of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is at work in you, sanctifying you, making you more fit for God's service. And you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You may live there, but you are a stranger. You're a stranger in your own home. And there's a reason that you're experiencing a lot of chop right now. It's okay. Be encouraged. Verse 3, praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Wow, now what is he saying? He's saying, hey, listen, I know you all are suffering because of what's going on all around you, but you need to praise God. You need to bless God, literally what it says there. Now, when I first read that, why would you want to bless God when you're suffering? And you know good and well, if God wanted to alleviate the suffering, he could. Why? He says, you want to bless God because he's given you a new birth. Now, we just talked about a baby being born just a moment ago. Can you think about anything more radical than a baby being born? Is there any experience physically in this life that's more radical than birth? There really isn't, is there? When you're born, everything starts. Everything is new. Everything is different. This is a life that's unlike any other, and it's going to be lived out. It's going to go on throughout time. It's hope. It's opportunity. And he says, listen, I want you to bless God even though you're facing suffering and trials because you have been born again. You've had this spiritual rebirth and it has changed everything because you've chosen to buy into the hope that comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because you've bought into that, it has secured for you an eternal future in heaven with God. And it's an inheritance it's yours. Everybody right now, just think about your inheritance for just a moment. Some of you have already blown it. Sorry about that. But for those of you who are waiting on your inheritance, I want you to imagine for a moment that inheritance is in the bank. And I want you to imagine for a moment that God is the banker. Is your inheritance secure? Oh yeah, it's secure. Is it going to perish? Nope. Is it going to be corrupted? Nope. Is it going to fade? Nope. Why? Because it's kept in heaven for you. He's saying, listen, I want you all to bless God because you've embraced the truth about who Jesus is and it's opened up for you a whole new life that has an eternity and a promise and a hope and a future and that is all kept by the power of God himself. Ever talk to someone about their own mortality who doesn't know Jesus Christ? And you talk to them and you say, so what happens next? What happens after you die? And it's things like, well, I guess. Well, I'm kind of hoping. Well, you see what he says is, listen, bless God, because you've embraced the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your future, your eternity is as secure and as an inheritance locked in a bank. And God's the banker. Praise God even though you're facing these terrible, terrible times. Then in verse 6, You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have struggled, have struggled in very, have had to struggle, sorry about that, in various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, pay attention to that little expression, the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You love him, though you have not seen him. 
And though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So why do we... um, Why are they permitted to suffer by God? That's what I wanted to know when I read this. God's got their eternity all locked up. It's guaranteed, right? It's locked away. So why are they suffering in the here and now? And he says, listen, I don't want y'all to misunderstand. I'm not saying suffering is a good thing, but I am saying to you that good things can come from what you're experiencing right now. This suffering can have a positive benefit. So what's the positive benefit? He says, listen, this suffering, these trials that you're experiencing right now, they are going to help make the genuineness of your faith be brought to the foreground. It's going to be obvious that your faith is legitimate. And knowing that you have real faith in God, that it's legit, well, that's worth more than gold. That's more precious than anything you can imagine, right? That's what he's saying. Because you want to know that your faith is genuine. And as I thought about this, I thought, well, if there's genuine faith, then that means there's false faith, right? And false faith could be borne out by these trials, just as genuine faith could be borne out. And so as I thought about this, I thought, well, what does a false faith look like? Because some of you all here in this room today, it may be that your faith is actually false. It's not actually genuine now, stay with me for just a moment. Here's some ways that we can have faith that's really kind of a false faith. It, faith, it, it sort of represents like faith, but when you press on it, maybe when it goes through a trial, it doesn't stand up, okay? So let's take a look. Here's a couple that I came up with. An inherited faith. My grandmother and grandfather, my mom and my dad were people of tremendous faith. They left for me a legacy of belief in Jesus Christ, and I'm so thankful for that. I mean, I am so thankful for that. Some of y'all have these amazing testimonies. I hear your story. You were like raised by wolves, and then, you know, you went on, and you, you were drug dealers and murderers and, you know, thugs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then after all that, you were wonderfully and radically saved. And I admire that story because I have a real boring vanilla testimony, okay? I grew up in a home where it was Jesus all the time, okay? There were like Bibles everywhere, okay? It was just, they were everywhere, and, and people were reading them, and it was a big deal in my home and in my grandmother's home. That's just how I grew up. So for me, it's very possible that if, you know, I could have had, like, this inherited faith because I went to church every single Sunday no matter what. Hurricane, pff, who cares, okay? Building could have been blown apart. We would have still been right there on the third row, you know, because that was our spot, and on Sunday, you're in your spot, you know, why is it wet in here? You know, that would have been us, okay? That's just the way I was. And if you're that person, maybe your faith is an inherited faith. Maybe you're riding on the coattails of your mom and dad's faith. You could be a 40-year-old person, man or woman, and still be riding on the coattails of somebody else's faith. Men, are you here today because you know that the best way to keep peace with your wife is to just go ahead and cave in and go to church? And your faith's not really yours, it's hers. And you just want peace in the valley. That's all you want. And so that's why you're here. And if you were really honest with yourself, you would say, yep, that's the extent of my faith. I would suggest to you that if that's it, your faith is probably not going to bear out under pressure, right? This is what Peter's talking about. He's saying, hey, listen, the benefit of all these trials and all this pressure is, is if you're not legit on this thing, you're out. If you've got an inherited faith, why would you stand and be persecuted for a faith that doesn't even belong to you? All right, so that's one possibility of a false faith. Look at another one here. Um, He's talking about a shallow faith. What do I mean by that? Remember, Jesus gives us the parable of the sower. Maybe you all remember that story. A man goes out to sow some seed, and he tells about where the seed lands. Some of it lands on shallow soil, sprouts, then the heat comes out, burns it up, and it's gone, right? Maybe your faith is a shallow faith. I encounter people from time to time, and this is what they're struggling with. They'll come to church because something's gone horribly wrong. And I mean horribly wrong. And it's a bad problem, you know. Wow, okay, all right. Bagpipes in church. That's a ringtone, my friend, okay. 
I'm sorry, I couldn't help but point that one out. Okay, let's come back because I am just like, wow, okay. Shallow faith is where we were. Let's dig back into that and see if we can get back on topic. There it is again, thanks. Okay, now you're just doing it on purpose. Okay. All right, so shallow faith. Um, so something's gone terribly wrong in your life. Uh, the divorce went final. The financial reversal really did happen. The funeral really did occur. You know, something terrible. I mean, horrible. These are big things, guys. They, I'm not making light of them. But you've taken this huge shot. I've seen it happen. People will take this huge shot. And all of a sudden, they're interested in church. And they're like, I am so there. And they're in church all the time, man. They're they are busting it wide open. But three, four weeks later, they're nowhere to be found. I mean, the crisis passed, boom, they're gone. What happened? Now listen, if you are the kind of person that struggles with what I just described, if that's you, let me just give you a little piece of advice, okay? Dig into church like your life depended on it. I mean, volunteer for everything, okay? Get involved in every Bible study. I mean, like, volunteer in the nursery, volunteer in the student ministry, volunteer to serve meals with your community. You get so plugged in that if you're not there, everyone notices because you need all the accountability you can get, right? I'm in a T group. Uh, T groups are something that we have here at Celebration I dearly love. I've been in probably eight or nine. I don't know how many of these things, a bunch and you get together in a tea group once a week. There's three different sets of material. T1, which is what I'm in right now, is fundamental discipleship. And so my tea group has four people in it. All tea groups have either three or four people because two is not a group. That's a pair. That doesn't count. And five, you begin to lose some accountability. So I'm in a tea group with a total of four of us, three other guys and myself. If I don't show up, do you think they notice? Yeah, they noticed. You know what that is? That's accountability, especially because I'm the preacher, and they're like, hey, you, you should have called. You, know, you should have told somebody. Right? I mean, I cannot miss my tea group, and I had sure better show it with my memory verse done because it looks really bad if the preacher can't do the memory verse, okay? That's just not a good look, right? So I need that pressure and accountability. If you're struggling with shallow faith, man, plug in. Plug in. Don't take it for granted. Don't just be that person just falls and just, yeah, I'm done now. Now, the uh, next one is kind of the reverse of the shallow faith, and that is the conditional faith. In this case, it's sort of the exact opposite, okay? Here's what I mean by that. Um, you're doing fine. You're, you're plugging along in faith, all this kind of stuff, and then what happens? Then the bad things start to occur. The funeral happens. The divorce goes final. The financial reversal hits. And when that happens to you, what do you do? Well, if God can do that, you know, if that's the kind of God that God is, forget it. I'm done with it. I'm over it. And you walk away. You see what I'm saying? That's a conditional faith. See, all along what happened when that testing came, what did it demonstrate? It demonstrated that your faith wasn't legit. It wasn't real. And I would submit to you that knowing your faith is real is a really good thing. It's really good to know the truth about who you are and what your standing is before God. You know, we're living in a day and age right now, for the first time in my lifetime, where it's not advantageous to be a Christian and to be in church. And when I grew up in my small town, my goodness, when you moved, somebody moved to our town, first thing they did was join church. I mean, there was only really three churches in town. There was no shopping, right? You just kind of went to the one close to your house, and that's where you sunk in, right? I mean, if you were Baptist, you went to the Baptist church. If you were Methodist, you went to the Methodist church. If you were Presbyterian, you went to the Methodist. You know, you get the idea. That's just what you did. And you would join day one because you could not function socially without being a part of the church, right? Those days are done. In fact, it's the opposite is true now. Being a part of the church, being known as a person who believes what we believe, remember what I talked about at the beginning? people look at you and they go, that is strange. That is peculiar. That's the world in which we live. And it's bringing pressure to bear. And some, when they face that pushback, they're just walking away. Now, statistically, over the last few years, for the first time in American history, the number of people who claim to be a Christian is falling, and it's falling rapidly. Why? Because when the pressure comes to bear, 
They're saying, you know what? This isn't who I am. This might have been who my mom and dad were. Or maybe I reached out to that when things were tough. Or maybe when things were good. You know, it could go either way. But that's not really me. I don't need this pushback. I don't need this problem. Peter says, listen, you're blessed when you know that what you believe about God, what you believe about Jesus, your eternal hope, you're blessed when you're 100% sold and it's been proven real. Because at the last day, you all, we're going to stand before God and he's going to judge us. And I want to stand before him with confidence because I know the only good thing about me is what Jesus Christ has done for me. And I want to hear him say, you're my child because you accepted Jesus Christ. You're in, you're in my family. I want to hear that. And the only confidence, the only hope that I have is to know that I have chosen to receive this wonderful and amazing gift that Jesus Christ offers me by his mercy and by his grace. It's not because of me. It's all because of him. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for what you have done for me. So Peter just basically throws it out there and he says, hey, is your faith real? Is your faith legit? Because you're suffering right now. And the good news about all that suffering, it's going to make the truth come to light. And some of you right now, you're, you're, if you were candid with yourself, you'd say, you know what? He's got me, man. My faith isn't real. I'm here because of my parents or my wife or whatever. I'm here because I'm reacting to the crisis. I know that if things don't go the way that I think they should go, I'm, I'm kind of on the bubble right now, and if that funeral happens, I'm out of here. If that divorce happens, I'm out of here. Whatever it might be. Is your faith real? I cannot imagine leaving here today without being able to put an anchor down and say, I'm, this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. I'm going to be a part of those who have the audacity to say, it makes me a stranger, it makes me an alien, but I believe with all of my heart in Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we're so grateful for what you have done. We're so grateful that you saw us in our need, that we were separated from you, and that you sent your son Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sin, and that you invite us into your home. And Father, we are so grateful that those who call upon the name of the Lord are saved, and that that salvation is secure for all of eternity, that our inheritance is locked away, kept by the power of God himself. We are so grateful, Father, that that's our reality. But for some in this room right now, they're having to ask themselves that question. It's a real gut check. Am I really there? You know, Is my faith genuine? And so, Lord, we just pray that right now, through the examination of the Holy Spirit, that you convict hearts and that you give people the courage and the audacity to stand and say, I've got to be one with Christ. That's just who I must be. And they'll make that decision. They may have been in church for years and years, but Father, their faith needs to be their own. So Lord, I pray that you give us the courage to respond to your call today. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' great, wonderful name.